Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Love, Truth, and Spirit Ministries. We're so blessed to have you here today. We're so blessed to share the Word of God together. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you, Father. Forgive us of our sins so we may come to your throne of grace with a righteous mind and a righteous heart. Father God in heaven, we know that you are on the throne, and we know prophetically that it is written in Isaiah 17 and in Ezekiel 38, Father, that one, you will destroy Damascus through Isaiah 17. You have foretold it, Father God in heaven. And as, he is, as the people of Israel are closer to war and actually at war, as proclaimed by uh, Netanyahu yesterday, Father God in heaven, we want to lift these people to you, Father. We want to pray for their salvation. We want to pray for a peace, that you would pour a peace into them, Father. We know this is your land. We know these are your people, Father God in heaven, as we are, as, as you have taught us through the whole New Testament of the Bible, Father. You have brought the Jew and the Gentile together as one. So, Father, we just ask that you would put your mighty hand on the land. You would put your mighty arms around the people, Father. You would give them protection. You would give them peace. You would flow your love into them. And, Father God in heaven, we ask that you, Father, would just smite the enemy that's coming against them once and for all, Father. We know the end of your word, the end of the Holy Scripture, Father, says that you will throw your enemies in the lake of fire. And we know that is true, Father, because you have written it. So we pray, Father God in heaven, that your will be done, your might be felt, your voice be heard, Father, in this day. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. It's titled Seven Letters to the Churches in the Apocalypse. It's not the building. And I say that with all due respect, it is not the building. It's not the building that we uh, reverence. It's not the land that we reverence. It is not our neighbor that we reverence. It's not the pastor of the church that we reverence. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that we should be reverencing and the Lord Jesus Christ that we should be focusing on. As Christians in today's environment, Scripture teaches us that we... Um, should only reverence uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. It also teaches us that our bodies are the temple, are the church. And if we believe we are the temple, we are the church, then all of these other uh, blessings or gifts from God are just that. They're blessings and gifts. If you're someone who uh, likes to attend church because you got a nice church building, you got comfortable seats, you got an awesome worship team you you know x y and z you come together and you go to church for on a sunday you go for an hour and then you go home and you don't do anything with the word of god um or if you start to look at the characteristics as we're going to look at in a minute here of the seven churches that jesus addressed in the book of revelation if you have these characteristics more so than some of the other characteristics that god uh, pours into us as he is sanctifying us, then I, I highly recommend that you get in your word, you get on your knees, you spend that time on Wednesday to fast and pray to ask God to course correct your thinking, to help you think in a different light, in his light. So if you're one of those people that, you know, put the building, put everything in around the building as more critical, and that's why you're attending the church you attend. It's because of the building. It's because X, Y, and Z, but you're not getting fed the full depth and breadth of the word, then I, I, I would recommend that you really think twice about staying where you're at. Maybe God has a different place for you. Maybe God wants you to move to hear the true word of God. We are in uh, difficult times. And I want to continue on by saying this about Israel. I just prayed for Israel. I don't know if everybody's aware, but they are at war. And Isaiah 17 warns us that when they go to war, when Israel goes to war, that Damascus will be a fallout. And that is one of the indications of the end times. Isaiah 17, please read it. It, it warns us that Damascus will fall. It will be leveled. There will be nothing left because God's judgment will fall against them. So we have to pay attention to that. Also pay attention to Ezekiel 38. 
Ezekiel 38 says that the Gog and Magog, the armies from the north, are going to come down and invade. But they'll also come from the south, the east, and the west. Israel will be surrounded by the world, and they, everybody will come against them. And we have to know this, that God chose Israel, the land and the people, and his protection will come in he will protect the land. He will protect the people. But again, what is a major sign that we look for, for the coming of Christ, for the rapture, for God and Jesus to come and get his church? This is a leading indicator. What happens in Israel is very important to the church. And if you're a pastor that's teaching eschatology and you're paying attention then you'll be sharing this with the congregation if you're sitting in a church and you're not hearing this from your pastor you really need to question why we're not talking about this israel is the linchpin um, for us again it's part of the light on the house that directs us to look up these things must occur wars rumors of wars Things like this, destruction, we're seeing it now. We're seeing wars, we're seeing rumors of wars. The difference uh, between this war and the Ukrainian war is it is directly against Israel, God's chosen people, God's chosen land. That's a significant difference. And I read some things uh, the past couple of days where, you know, China may take opportunity to attack Taiwan and take their land, and other things, Russia getting involved. We know that our government is lackluster when it comes to Israel right now. You know, and this is not a political statement, this is a statement of fact. We do not stand behind Israel. Just by the actions of what has been taking place. So we need to pay attention to that also. When you have a government, an administration that gives Iran the ones who uh, proclaim to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, you give them six or six billion dollars. You give Hamas, you arm them with our, uh, the weapons that we use, the same weapons. You train them. And this has all transpired ever since the changing of our administration. And again, this isn't a, a political statement. This is a statement of fact that we, are, as a church, need to stand up against what's going on. We need to pray against uh, what's going on with our leadership and pray that they see God and they see him quickly and his judgment fall quickly if they are def um, coming against uh, not only us but our people. So with that said, I'll transition back into the churches. And I think it's apropos now that when we read the letters of the church that Jesus uh, gave to John so he could write and pen these letters and send them to every church that there is something interesting in every church that Jesus wrote to. And if we look at the letters, you know, there are four elements or four components to, to the letter. It has a commendation. It has a criticism. It has instruction, and it has a promise. And as we go through the letter, we are going to find out what Jesus spoke to um, each church about and how that not only applied in the first century to the churches, but through time it applies. There's no better time than now to see how these letters impact the church today. That letter, those letters are as relevant today as it to the church as they are uh, or were in the first century. And one of the things that uh, is interesting as we study the letters, you know, uh, Domitian was the emperor, the Roman emperor at the time. John was exiled to the island of Patmos. Why was he exiled to Patmos? Because he was spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that went against the government. That went against uh, the emperor and his dictates not to spread the word of Jesus Christ. Now, God's hand was around John for a couple of reasons that I'll point out. One, the emperor could have had 
John killed. We know the other apostles were all martyred. Peter, uh, Paul, James, you know, the list of Matthew, Luke, Mark. They were all martyred in the name of getting the, uh, G- the gospel of Jesus Christ out. But John was protected. The omission could have had him hung, beheaded, crucified. You name the death, the means of death, and it could have occurred. But it didn't occur to John because God had an important uh, mission for John, and that was to pen the book of Revelation. Now, you think that John was going to be taken out of society, put on this island. And at the time, it was a copper, uh, a, a copper uh, mining uh, island. And there wasn't a lot going on on the island. There were a lot of prisoners exiled to this island. But John and God, more so God, knew exactly what he was doing when John went to the island. He not only penned and had the vision of Jesus Christ, of heaven, and the ability to write the book of Revelation, but God took what Domitian, or Satan actually, was turning into evil, taking him out of society, stifling the word, or the gospel of Jesus, the word of God. And God turned that ash into beauty. Because John at that point wrote one of the most important books of Revelation. Why is it really important? Because it gives you a contrast of heaven and hell. It tells you, it reveals who Jesus Christ is. It reveals to us that Jesus has been given authority to judge the world during the tribulation. And it also tells us that Jesus wins the ultimate battle, as he won every battle. He has not lost. But this is what is important. He comes up against Satan. He comes up against the Antichrist. He comes up against a false prophet. He comes up against those who took the mark of the beast. He throws them all in a lake of fire. This is what gets revealed to us in the book of Revelation. And there's a lot more. But I'm just giving you the highlights of why it is important to read Revelation. Why is it important to study Revelation? Because we understand, A, where we're going. We understand why we're going there. And we understand that God loves us so much that he gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to receive him and to follow him into the kingdom of heaven. That's why it's important. So we're going to read Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 today, to set up the context. I'm going to do something a little bit different. We're just going to read this, these verses here, 9 through 11, and then we're going to jump into the characteristics of the seven letters. So what I want you to do, be prepared for, I'm not going to read a, a revelation uh, about the churches. What I'd like you to do is write down the scripture that I provide to you and then read it on your own. And get in your word, ask the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, to start speaking to you. Speak to your heart. And look at the characteristics of of the seven churches. And identify, if we are the church, if we are the building of the church, identify, do you possess more of these characteristics than not? Because that will give you a good litmus test on where you are at in your Christian walk. And if you're totally honest with yourself, it's a good opportunity for God to come in and course correct you and teach you his ways, not the ways of the world. Because Jesus absolutely, when he was writing these letters, was pinpointing emperor worship. He was pinpointing, you know, worship of idols. He was pinpointing sexual immorality. He was pinpointing compromise. And if you, if you possess these characteristics as a Christian, then you need to check yourself because if it is true that Jesus is coming quickly, then you have not much time to course correct. But you can course correct through the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Ask God 
to renew your mind. Ask God to give you a view of what's going on through the lens of his son, Jesus Christ. So you can see what's going on. You can have a discernment. That's what we'll ask. So let's jump into the message. Revelation 1, 9 through 11. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the, on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and testimony of Jesus. I was in spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Why am I only reading 9 through 11? Because I want to set up a couple of things here. It is John. He's our brother. He's our partner. Although he is in heaven right now, he is still our brother. He is still our partner. He's writing to the Christian. He's writing to the Jewish Christian. He's writing to anyone who has an ear to hear. And we'll find out what that meaning is when Jesus tells us, for those who have an ear to hear, let them hear. Because it's important. Jesus is speaking loud. He's speaking so loud right now. It's deafening. And unfortunately, people are not paying attention. I read all the time and I talk to other pastors They don't believe that we're in the time that we're in. They believe we have more time. They don't believe in the signs. They will not change their message. And all that suggests to me is you're not filled. You don't have a discernment. You're not seeing what's going on. We are called to be watchmen. We're supposed to watch for these things coming. We're supposed to share with our congregations these things that are happening. We're supposed to prepare the people that God has given us responsibility to grow spiritually. And I'm not saying it's our responsibility to grow them. It's our responsibility to give them the word of God and let the Holy Spirit speak into them. But it is our responsibility to give them that truth. And we have to give them that truth. And it's interesting. John says it himself. His his patient endurance through the tribulation. And the tribulation will come. Fortunately, if you're a pre-tribulation believer as I am, the church will be gone. And if you look and study the book of Revelation, chapter 1, 2, and 3 talks about what Revelation is, addresses the seven letters of the church in chapter 4. John gets whisked into heaven. We believe that the church goes with him. But we are now in heaven. The church is gone. Matter of fact, if you read 4 through 22, you're not going to read much about the existence of the church. That's why we believe that we will be raptured. And there are other beliefs out there. You know, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just interpreting the scripture as I understand it, as the Holy Spirit speaks into me. So you got to take a position, though. That's the message. You need to understand. Understand this. If God sent his only begotten son, why would God drag us through uh, his judgment, his final judgment? Why would he expose a church to that? That doesn't make sense to me. But that's for a whole nother study. So let's look at, uh, let, let's break down uh, uh, scripture. Seven is a number of completeness, perfection, abundance, and rest in the Bible, in the New Testament. And the Old Testament. So the number seven. So we have seven churches here. Each letter is a prophetic word from Jesus. He gives a prophetic word. Because there's an eschatological element to what he's telling us. These things will happen. If you do not do something, then something else will happen. It's characteristic if you're a software engineer or you know about writing code. It's an if-else statement. If this happens, else this, then this, right? So we can, we can look at it in a couple of different ways. As I mentioned earlier, the four components are commendation, criticism, instruction, and promise. These things are what's important to understand. And he writes to the angels, to the seven churches, the seven angels, the seven lampstands, 
I don't want to get into that detail right now. Please join us for the Bible study. We can get into it. But let's talk about uh, jumping into the church now. So the observation on the church, the seven letters, the seven churches. Let's see, seeing God through our tribulation. That's what John was saying. He sees God through our tribulation. That's a message for us. When we're in a trial, when we're in a, when we're in a tribulation, we should see God in that tribulation. I liken it to this. I've used this example before. If you're in a tornado and you're in the center of the tornado and you look straight up, you're going to see blue sky. You're going to see a calm. That is Jesus. When we're in a tribulation, when we're in a trial and everything is spinning around us and we think it's out of control, we look up, we see Jesus. Jesus with his hands there. It's the same thing John is saying. We see, he sees God through The tribulation, the apostles seen God through the tribulations. That's why it was so easy for them to be martyred in the name of Christ, for Christ, for spreading the word of God, because they seen God. They didn't pay attention to the buildings that they were in. They didn't pay attention to the fancy seats. They didn't pay attention to the awesome worship. They didn't pay attention to any of that. What they paid attention to was the most important person in their lives, which is God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they paid attention to. John wrote Revelation of Jesus Christ in exile. He was exiled. Again, I'll go back to this. What Satan wanted to burn up and turn into ashes, God turned into beauty. And it was God's perfect plan to put John in an isolated environment where he could hear and meditate on God. And see the visions. And hear the voice of the Lord. And then write those things down that he heard in the book. This is why John tells us, when you meditate, when you can see God in your tribulation, it becomes important for our spiritual growth. God speaks clearly when you meditate on him. Revelation 1.10 We know when God speaks into us. If we're surrounded, if we're in some nightclub with blaring music at 110 decibels, you're not going to hear the voice of God in you speaking to you. You'll hear all the chatter around you. God speaks clearly when you meditate on him. That meditation may not happen in 30 seconds. It may not happen in five minutes. It may not happen in 30 minutes. But when you meditate on the Lord Jesus Christ, I guarantee you, Jesus will speak to you. But you have to be willing to give Jesus the time to speak into you, to speak through you, to guide you, to show you his instruction. John writes to the church, Jesus' words, Revelation 1.11, tells us. He writes everything that he is supposed to see and hear and document it. Now, we know John did an excellent job because we have the book, we have revelation, everything that John has seen. And I am convinced of this some of the descriptions that John gives us that just are, are the things that he can relate to in his time. Some things were probably so beautiful when he describes heaven when he describes what heaven is going to look like, how big heaven is. Those things you can only describe and try to relate to the people at the time. You can relate it to us at the time so we can get a sense of how beautiful heaven is, how ugly hell is, what kind of life we're going to have in heaven, what kind of life you will have in hell. That's what John is conveying to us. That's the revelation that God is pouring into us. That's why it's so important. I've shared this statistic before. I'll share it again because it is so important. 2% as of 2018, 2% of the pastors teach their congregation uh, the book of Revelation for numerous reasons that we won't get into now. But it's sad. And I'm not saying only 2% of the uh, congregations across the country or across the, this is just centric to the United States, 
across the country are getting it because I believe people take initiative to read the book on their own, try to study it on their own. They'll get into a, a group that is studying Revelation. I'm not suggesting that at all. People find a way. God, when they speak, when God speaks into us, we find a way to learn what God is trying to say. What I'm saying is, though, that two percent of these uh, pastors who stand behind a pulpit and are responsible to share the Word of God do not share uh, one of the most important books of the Bible, the Book of Revelation. And you know what? There will be a price paid for that, and that's not a threat. That uh, there's a consequence for all our actions no matter what. So be warned. Characteristics of the seven churches. Let's jump, run through them. So please get your pen and pencil out or paper out or, you know, pick up on the, uh, the sermon on YouTube and you can go through it. You can stop it, write it down, go through it. But I, I, I pray that you would read uh, chapter, uh, just read chapter one through three. And we'll talk about you know, the, the state of the church, the purpose of revelation. So Ephesus, let's look at the first church. Ephesus was called the loveless church. Revelation 2, 1 through 7. Why? The commendation rejects evil, perseveres, has patience. Revelation 2, 2 through 3. This is the commendation that Jesus is bringing to the church. So we know Jesus, he's going to give you the good. Then he's going to give you the bad. Then he's going to instruct you how to get better to remove the bad and get into the good. Then he's going to give you a promise. If you turn from your ways, what's the criticism of the church that they had forsaken its first love. Now, some commentators think it's the first love. Maybe Jesus, they walked away from Jesus. Some commentators believe that maybe it's the first love where the congregation wasn't starting to love each other. And there was a lot of consternation. There was a lot of backbiting in a church. I believe that it's a combination of both. Where you lose your first love for Jesus and then you lose that love that you have for your fellow congregation. And you start to backbite and you start to, you know, bring in Satan into your congregation. That's what I believe. And matter of fact, if you really do an analysis on it, if you lose the love that you have for Jesus, your heart will get hard. It will turn into the world. And by default, you'll end up starting to dislike others around you. You'll be selective in liking people instead of following the precepts and the instruction from Jesus to love one another no matter what instruction repent and this is a common thread the word repent do the works you first did the love that you first had not only for Jesus but for each other building the church building what God has brought to you remember Paul was instrumental in building the church in Ephesus he's got a couple of letters that he addresses what's the promise that God gives the tree of life if you repent, and this is important, this is the if then, if else then statement. If you repent, you will find the tree of life. Else, you will find the lake of fire. He will eliminate you. Let's look at the second church, Smyrna. Now, keep in mind, visually, and I didn't put a map up, but I'll, I'll try to show you visually. Patmos is out here, and you're looking in Turkey. It's an island about uh, 30, 40 miles off the coast. Ephesus is the first port that the church goes into, so it would be logical that John hands off the letter to the uh, postal service. I'm just kidding. It's not the postal. A carrier, someone assigned to take the letters to the church. Ephesus. Then it goes up to Smyrna. Then it goes to Pergamos, Thyatira, and down. So it's a circular letter. These letters were intended to be writ, uh, carried through that whole circle. From Ephesus to Laodicea. And each church was to read each letter. It wasn't a church addressed to a specific, or a letter addressed to a specific church. It was letters and the characteristics that Jesus is trying to 
whitewash us from, not in a sense, not in a bad way, to wash us clean of those things that he is talking to the church about. So let's look. Smyrna was the persecuted church. Their commendation gracefully bears suffering. There was suffering going on in that church. And they withstood the suffering. What is the criticism Jesus has? None, because the church was suffering in his name. There were things happening. There was martyrdom going on in the church. What is the instruction that Jesus gives? Be faithful until death. Revelation 2.10 tells us. Revelation 2.11 says, what is the promise? The crown of life. If you endure to the end, if you're faithful until your death, you will have the crown of life. And these are all descriptions that when you die, you will be in the heaven. You will see the tree of life. You will be given a tree of life. You will be given the crown of life. These are all our rewards for doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Let's look at the next church, Pergamum, Revelation 2, 12 through 17. The compromising church. And we know and we see and we read a lot about the compromising church in today's environment. Matter of fact, I'm going to remind you, these letters are as applicable today as they were when John was writing and they were being read in the first century. Throughout time, these are all applicable. Applicable. What's accommodation of the compromising church? Keeps the faith of Christ, Revelation 2:13 through 14. The criticism here tolerates immorality, idolatry, and heresies. So there was false teachers coming into the church and teaching emperor worship, teaching that worshiping uh, gods, small g gods, was still acceptable. That is not acceptable if you're a Christian. It is not. What is the instruction? <laughs> It's very clear. Repent. Revelation 2.16. And then what he says. What's the promise? You have hidden manna and a stone with a new name. Revelation 2.17. He will give us the food of life. Jesus is the bread of life. And this is why he uses the term manna. And he's going to give us a new name. He'll give us a stone with a new name. If you know anything about Revelation, we also have a new mind. We have a new body. And we'll have a new name. And it's so important that we understand that we will be made whole, made new in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in our glorified states. Thyatira, the corrupt church, Revelation 2, 18 through 29. This is one of the longest letters in the book that Jesus had to address. They must have had some real serious issues for Jesus to pen this long of a letter. What's a commendation? They loved each other. They had service. Patience are greater than the first. Uh, patience. And all of these three things were greater than at first. So when they first started the church, they started out a little cold. And then they warmed up and warmed up. What is the criticism? There was a false prophet who came in. Everybody's aware of the name Jezebel. She was the leader of the church. She was turning the congregation into eating um, sacrifices to small G gods. She was teaching to men to have immoral sex with others. And that's what she was about. Here's the other criticism. Tolerates idolatry and immorality. Revelation 2.20. What was the instruction? From Jesus, judgment is coming soon. Keep the faith. Repent. Again, the repent word there. He, it says in the letter to Thyrotia, Jesus gave Jezebel time to repent and she ignored it. She let time run out. Again, what is that analogous of? What should we pull from that? Jesus is patient. He will wait. But there is a clock. There is a timer, and when that timer shuts off, there is no more time. And this is what Jesus told the church of Thyatira. What's a promise? He'll give us the rule over nations and receive the morning star. Morning star is another description of who Jesus is. Revelation 2.29. Do you see the common thread of what we're seeing here? The corrupt church, the compromising church, the church that lost her first love, the persecuted church. We see all of these things happening. We see this in our churches today. 
It's relevant today. I got to make that point over and over again so people understand. These letters are intended for us. And if we are the church, and we're going to get there in a few minutes, if we are the church, we are the building, then these letters apply to us personally. You can't look at the building. You can't blame someone else. You look at yourself if you are the church. If you have the Lord Jesus Christ in you, if God resides in you, then these letters are applicable to you and me. This is why it's so important, especially in today's times, especially if the Lord is going to come and get his church. If we're going to meet Jesus in the air, you need to be prepared. These are all warnings to us all. And you know what? Even if Jesus doesn't come tomorrow or the next day or next week or next year, when you follow these precepts and follow the instructions that Jesus gives us, you are going to ensure yourself a place in the kingdom of heaven. Otherwise, you are at risk. Sardis, the dead church. Commendations here. Some have kept the faith. So this is a church that had a mixed breed. Most people were unfaithful following false teachings, trying to propagate the false teaching. But there are others that were faithful to the word of God. Criticism, the church that had fallen asleep. Again, hence the dead church. Are you in a church that has fallen asleep, that doesn't pay attention? The whole preparation that Jesus gives us in his word about the end days coming culminates to this. The church that had fallen asleep, Revelation 3, 2. The instruction, again, repent. Repent, strengthen what remains, Revelation 2, 5. The promise that he has for us, faithful, honored, clothed, clothed in white. We'll be faithfully honored. We'll be clothed in white. He will give us the robes. We will not, we'll have a stone. We'll have a new name. We'll have a new wardrobe. Revelation 3, 6 should say that, and actually 3.5, not 2.5, not 2.6. For Sardis, um, I got a typo there. It's Revelation 3.5 for instruction. Promise is 3.6. My apologies. Philadelphia, the faithful church. Now, everybody wants to be or perceives to be the church of Philadelphia. Why? Because they perseveres of the faith. They kept the words of Christ. They honored his name. And a little bit of a backstory, they also set up a huge mission field. They were bringing in people to share the gospel, Matthew 28. Go out and make disciples of all the nations. The Church of Philadelphia embraced those words, embraced that action. And they were sending missionaries out. Jesus loved it. Jesus loved it because the church took it seriously to get the word of God out. To all the nations. Revelation 3, 8 through 12. What's the criticism? No criticisms there. Because they were following God. They were following his word. They honored his name. They didn't defile his name. They didn't put up with this nonsense on compromising. On corrupting. Listening to the false teachers. Following the false teachers. Following false doctrine. They didn't do it. What's the instruction? Keep the faith. As persecution comes against us, keep the faith. Keep going. Keep moving on is what Jesus is saying. The promise, a place in God's presence, a new name, and the new Jerusalem, Revelation 3.13. So this is where we look at the new Jerusalem is going to come down. At the end of Revelation, we talk about the new Jerusalem. And we see it descending from heaven in its new resting place in the Garden of Eden. On earth. Let's look at Laodicea. The lukewarm church. Revelation 3. 14 through 22. What's a commendation? There is no commendations for a lukewarm church. Jesus says I would rather. Spit you out. Than be lukewarm. Or, or uh, hot nor cold. If you are lukewarm. He will spit you out. He will have nothing to do with you. And if you really study and understand Laodicea, it was a rich, affluent 
community. A lot of doctors there. A lot of medicine there. A lot of rich people there. But guess what? They were lukewarm. Because with your riches, you don't need Jesus Christ. Your riches will solve all your problems. Here's a common thread through all of these churches. They all had temples of Zeus, other small G God temples, statues everywhere. And these things were penetrating the church. They were being allowed by church leaders to come in and take over the congregation. Remember this, get along, go along to get along. Never works out in your favor. Especially when it comes to compromising God's word. It will never work out. Look at the criticism. Indifferent. The church with the lukewarm faith. They had no faith. Yeah, they went through the motions. Yeah, they showed up every Sunday. Yeah, they went home and they got back in their, you know, mode of operandi according to the world. Instruction. Be zealous and what? Repent. Be zealous. Get that fire in your belly. Start to believe the word of God. Start to live the word of God with your zealousness. What's the promise? Share Christ's throne. We will share his throne in the kingdom of heaven. It's not more difficult than that. If you look at all the promises that Jesus gives us, heaven, 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 Heaven. All seven times he promises us heaven. If we endure to the end. Now what's interesting about this is this. It's not the building. It's the true believers that are the church. Why am I saying this? Because if you go back and you you can Google this all day long. This is a beautiful thing now. You can look in Turkey where the churches existed. You can look where people have visited the sites of the churches. These churches are no longer standing. They no longer exist. It's no longer about the building. That's the message that as I've been going through Revelation several times and studying the word of God, it's not about the things around us. It's the, about what is in us. The Lord Jesus Christ that matters. It's not the fancy seats. It's not the fancy glass. It's not the fancy sound system. You know, are those gifts that God gives to us? Yes. Should you receive those if God gives them to you? Yes. Should you reverence them? No. Does it matter? Not to God. What matters is your soul. What matters is your heart. What matters is are you going to get to heaven? That's what matters. It's not the building. It is the true believers in the building. That's why Jesus wrote these letters. That's why we see significant differences in the letters. The common thread in instruction is what? Repent. The only time he, Jesus in the seven letters, two of the five letters, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Because they were doing the things that God expected them to do. There was no instruction to repent. Every other church that was falling by the wayside, Jesus, repent, turn from your ways. Be a part of the kingdom of heaven. Take it seriously and start acting appropriately. We are in tough times. So we are the building. And this is going to be what I really want you to remember. 1 Corinthians 3 9 says, What? For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So Paul is saying, We're the workers, we're coming. We're going to give you the word of God. But guess what? He identifies us as what? The field. We're the mission field, we're the building. We're God's building. We house. Paul was not talking about some physical structure here. He's not talking about some farmer's field. He's talking about you and I. In our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our strength. God dwells in us. 
Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, what does he say? Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Go back to the seven letters. If we are the temple, we are God's temple. We are God's church. All we need to do is understand that those letters apply to each one of us. And I believe that we transition through some of those letters often. You know, hopefully not too often. Hopefully some of those characteristics die off. So we can become the church that God has intended us to be. We can become the men and women that God intends us to be living in Christ, living for Christ, living with Christ. Jesus is the cornerstone of every building. If we are the temple, he's the cornerstone in us. What does Ephesians 2, 20 through 22 say? Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, there's no way that we're being taught here that the apostles and the disciples are the building or the word of God is being built on them. Jesus is the cornerstone of the building. What that scripture is telling us is that when you spread the word of God out, when you share the word of God, we are starting to build that infrastructure. We plant the seeds as another way to look at it. And others come in and they'll water the seed. But you know what? The Holy Spirit will make that seed grow. And it's only through the Holy Spirit that the seed grows. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, or if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you know, 50% of the time, you will not bear good fruit. There's many, many teachings on, on that, that we need to start paying attention to. And it's more incumbent, more important uh, to us today with what's going on in Israel, with what's going on with the globe, with, what, with what's going on with our children, that we need to prepare. God will live with us for eternity. We are the temple of the living God. And this is going to be hard, but you know what? Here it comes. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, Paul is not telling us not to uh, interface or entertain or be with unbelievers here. What he's saying is the characteristics of the unbeliever do not associate with. Our job is to share the gospel. You don't share the gospel with just the people who profess to be Christians. We share to the gospel to all who have ears to hear. That's, what we sh that's who we share the gospel with. So don't walk away thinking, well, you know, I'm not supposed to have friends at work. I'm not supposed to have non-Christian friends. But when you bring on their characteristics, when you start living the life that they're living, as a non-Christian, this is what Paul is warning us about. There is no room in a dark place for the light to share each other. When the light comes in, the dark goes away. These are the things that Paul is teaching. These are the things that Jesus are teaching. This is what is really important in understanding to us. We have to allow sanctification. 
That means a changing of and growing spiritually in the Lord Jesus Christ. That means that we need to die to ourselves. We need to release ourselves from this world. And if we don't have the strength to do it, you ask the Holy Spirit, you ask Jesus Christ to come in and change you. We know one thing, God can do all things. We know another thing, that God can change you on a dime. Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul was a murderer when he met Jesus. After he left Jesus, he was one of the greatest apostles that we read in the Bible. Because he was zealous. He knew his mission. Do you know your mission? Do you understand what God is asking you to do? He's asking you to look up, especially in today's time. It's more prevalent now than ever. Israel is at war. We need to pray for Israel. But we also know God is going to protect that land. And we're going to see a falling. We're going to see a falling away of the church. We're going to see a falling away of uh, the people who are attacking Israel. Because we are going to see God's hand in all of this. And praise be to God, glory in his name, that he shows himself to the world. So everyone, every ear will hear, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. Let's look at an encouraging verse here, Matthew 18, 20. For where there are, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And let me just kind of emphasize that a little bit. You only need two or more to speak of Jesus, Jesus will be there. His Holy Spirit will be there. And let me give you an example. If you go to China, the underground church, you go anywhere where they're persecuting Christians, there are Christians underground. I was sharing this last week with a couple of people. They would take a page of the Bible and they would hand it around. They would rip out different pages and give it to different people because if they got caught, they would only lose Two, because of the both side print, they would lose two pages of what they perceived is the greatest gift that they, they were ever given, the Holy Word of God. And in the underground church, they would pass it around. One day, one section of people would get a page, they would pass it to the next. Just like the circular letters that we read about in the book of Revelation, we're giving we're being given the word of God, and God wants us to pass it around, just like the seven letters. And that's what, if you see the underground churches across the globe, that's what they do. That's how they do it. That's how they get the word of God around. In Iran, that's how they get the word of God around. In other places where they fear for their lives because of the Lord Jesus Christ and spreading his gospel. We have it easy in this country because there's still limited free speech as we see. The government wants to shut you down, they will shut you down. They will contrive ways to shut you down because they're not accountable. They, are, they think they're not accountable to God, but I guarantee you, God's judgment will fall and it will fall hard on those who come against Israel and Israel's and God's people, period. It's written, we believe it. And you know what? If you're a nation that is coming against Israel, uh, you better be warned. And here's, here's the problem. It's not your words. It's not your lip service. It's your actions that matter. We are in a moment in time where action is more important than idle words. It's like a clanging drum, uh, gong, as Paul tells us. If you have actions that come against the word of God, you, that come against God's chosen, that come against, uh, you know, the precepts of God, God's instruction, you're like a banging gong. And eventually, you will be judged. Maybe not in our time, maybe not when we see it, but you know what? We all sit on that judgment seat. And this is what God was warning the church about. He was warning the church that you have some issues. 
solve your issues. Get right. I will give you instructions how to solve your issues. But as we see, those issues propagate from generation to generation, year to year, decade to decade, century to century, millennia to millennia. As people are unwilling to take seriously the word of God, or what they'll do is they'll read into the Word of God. They'll try to make it seem like it's saying something that it's not. And what we have to be is we have to be Bereans. We have to keep our eyes open, our hearts pure, our minds sharp. Because when the great deception comes, it is, it is written biblically, deception will come. We need to be in tune with the Lord Jesus Christ, His Word, the Gospel. We need to surround ourselves with people who believe as we believe. Because even the elect, if possible, will fall away. And we know if the elect start to fall away that it was not possible that they were given over to God. And they've given their life to God. Because once God, I believe this, once God grabs you and he grabs a hold of you, you're not turning away. You've given your heart, you've given your mind, you've given your soul and all your strength to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we may play a dangerous game because it's fun to kind of, you know, navigate in and out of the word of God. But I'll tell you, there is no time anymore to navigate in and out. You're either in or you're out. And that's the message that God has been giving me through this rapture series. That's the message that God is giving other pastors. We're in tune. There's a whole uh, eschatological set of people out there, pastors and others who love eschatology, who follow what's going on. And we see the signs. And you know what? Our hope is this, that we will meet Jesus in the sky. We won't see this judgment. Our sadness becomes, we know family members, we know others who will not meet Jesus in the sky when he raptures the church. He will meet them after the seven-year tribulation. And by then, it's too late. The first three and a half years or so, you got a good shot. You know, as I'm studying Revelation and I have, as I've taught it and studied it, what God has spoken into me is this, that through the seal judgment, through the trumpet judgment, through the bowl judgment, up until the point of the mark of the beast, and we don't know what that exact timing looks like, but we know this, you have a chance to be martyred to get into heaven. Otherwise, it's too late. So let's close in prayer. Let's really... Bring Israel to our, our hearts and minds, and, and let's just pray for ourselves. Dear Father in heaven, we just ask, Lord, that you would breathe life into us, that you would be in us, Father. Protect your chosen nation. Protect your people, Father. Protect the church. Lord God in heaven, for all those who have ears to hear this message today, I pray that you would read uh, the scripture that we studied today, that we talked about today. We would understand that what you are telling the church, how to course correct, how to get back on track, how to find heaven, Father in, in, in heaven, uh, that we would be with you for glory, uh, in our glory state, in your glory state, for eternity, Father, that we may just start to live the life that you've given us, and that we look up, because at some point when we look up, we are going to see you coming off that cloud, Father. So we just thank you, Jesus. We pray and, and we just give you all glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So if you want a Bible, please reach out to us. If you need prayer, please, please, please reach out. Our backpacks are coming along pretty good. Uh, please indicate if you need backpacks or if you know someone in need, you know, you got a homeless shelter or someone you want us to, to minister with, be partners with, uh, please reach out. Uh, www.ltsministries.org. Uh, you can contact me there. There's a contact page. My number's up there. You can call me specifically. Uh, you can send me emails. 
So have a blessed day. Uh, may the Lord just pour into you. May he keep you. May he give you a peace. And may he, his instruction just be etched in your heart, minds, and soul for the rest of your days. Have a blessed day. Have a wonderful week. And God bless you. Lord willing, we'll see you Tuesday. Wednesday, we'll pray with you. Next Sunday, we'll be here. So in Jesus' mighty name, we pray this. Amen.